Hello, ladies and gentlemen. We are here for another edition of JJ's Watch Hangout. We got a full cast here for you today, a full panel. We're getting ready to get into some deep discussion. Of course, we're joined by my man Ali Reza in the house. Check him out on the gram, Ape Lugs. We have my man Paul Thorpe in the house. What's up, Paul? Good to see you. Hey, no. And we have some new faces for you, ladies and gents out there. We have Bradley Peterson and Steve Allen also joining along. Welcome, guys. Now, Great to be here. We're glad to have you. Now, today we're going to get into some of the ins and outs, some Q&A. A lot of people got questions, and hopefully we're going to provide some solid answers for you guys today about the digital watch vault. It's going to be a good show, guys. Uh, let's keep it respectful. Let's get the real questions in that you guys want to know. Um, we're here to get to the, you know, we're here to get into the deep end of it and really find out if this is something you guys would be interested in. So let's give it a give it a go. But before we start, let's do our usual, get a wristwatch check going. What do we got on the wrist, fellas? I am wearing my Paul Newman Daytona in honor of Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I've got the Coral Sonia Unsone Waltz. Nice, nice. Roy I have a space sure. ready for the for our next watch. Oh, there we go. All right. Guys, I I have a Zero S, and I got to tell you, I love the history behind the watch. So um, it's one of my favorites. Okay. Zero S. Okay, fair enough. Let's run through the chat, say hello to some of the fellas out there, and the ladies, of course. We don't want to forget the ladies. And then uh, we'll get right into it. So we got Patrick B first. Very good. Thank you, Patrick. We got our first super chat of the day by our man Gary. You watch at 63. Thank you, Gary. Appreciate that. Five pounds. It's in for the race. Sounds good, buddy. We got our man Hideki in the house. Welcome, Hideki. Good to see you. We got P. Lucas. He says the best channel to have this QA. I do wow. appreciate that. Very kind of you. We got our man Swinging Kangaroo in the house. Good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> good to see our friend Swinton. I think and we should super chat him for a name like that. <laughs> <laughs> he actually, funny story about him, I'll tell you quick, had his regular name up there, but Archie couldn't pronounce it and he kept calling him Swinging Kangaroo. So that's just how it stuck. But great. I like that. <laughs> right. So we got Art Vandalay with $5 super chat. He says, need opinions on forecasting the next 12 months price fluctuation. Look into the Magic 8-Ball. Thanks, guys. Clever name. Clever name, Art Vandalay. <laughs> Great name. Should uh, we do that one? Sure, yeah, if you want to throw out a... I mean, look, he obviously knows it's a bit of fun, Magic 8-Ball. So, what, you know, he could throw out a, you know, a guess. Obviously, we can't hold anyone to anything. Okay, I'll go first. Um, I have a feeling that things ain't going to get any better, if I'm honest. Same. I think uh, I don't I lower or, or same. Yeah, yeah. I I can't sit here, even though people like to cast me as the protector of the grain market. Um, I can't I can't sit here and honestly <laughs> say with my hand on my heart that prices are gonna go up next year. Um I think it's gonna be much of the same for me. I agree. I agree. You know, it's like even in the stock market, you know, the, when you don't want to catch the falling knife and it's I haven't seen any signs of a rebound. So I would say at least plateau or slightly lower. I don't think it's going to really fall off a cliff, but, you know, no, no, no. I think it's I think any cliff falling has has more to do with geopolitics than the market itself. Right. right. That's a hard one to predict. But right. what I've observed in the dealer chats, all indications are like more and more people are bailing um, in the dealer chats. Uh, especially the paid dealer chats, which is a leading indicator. Like the more people bail, the more price pressure there is. Yeah. Right. Mike says, I'll be interested to see if we can get some deep technical details tonight. I think that's what's missing for some folks. Yes, that's exactly what we're going to get into tonight. Yeah, I hope we get the uh, technical details too. <laughs> <laughs> we got Anthony P in the house, member of the crew, reminding everyone to upvote. Thank you, Anthony P. Always appreciate you. We got Serdy in the house. We got Calcoy in the house. We got Tictology in the house. JBJB, good to see a lot of familiar faces. Um, hey, you know. Yeah, everybody's here. Everybody's here and ready to hear about it. We got uh, our man London in the house. As best, oh, that's very kind of you. Best live stream in wow. the land. Well, tough to live up to that, but you know we'll do what we can here. And we got one more super chat, and then we'll get rolling. We got P Cars nineteen seventy with the five dollars super chat. He says, "Hey, all, good to see Paul on the panel. Taxes are due. No Daytona for now." It's all right. You got plenty of time, P cars. I don't see the market moving anywhere. Pay your taxes. You know, you don't want to not pay your taxes. That's the, uh, you know, that could get you in some uh, some trouble there. I think, I think the good news, I think the good news for the buyers out there 
I think 2024, keeping my fingers crossed. There's two things here, right? And uh, look, I don't want to see guys like you and I. Um, do you want to do this super chat, the next one? Sure, sure. We got our man Patel Philippe, Tan the Man in the house with a $50 mega bomb super chat here. Thank you, Patel. Appreciate that. Uh, that's our friend Tanzil, of course. He says, great panel today. Thank you, JJ, Ali, Paul, and team for getting the stream going. Excited for it. Thank you very much. Appreciate the generous support, Tan. And he's also a member, of course. Thank you, Tan. Excellent. I was, I was just, I was just going to say, I don't, I don't want to see the value of our watches on our wrists. That's yours, mine, and the people watching. I don't want to see those values drop anymore. Um, but what I would say is, I think the good news is, twenty twenty four. I think we're going to be getting a lot more watches out of the ads. Um, yeah. I, I've got a video coming out on that pretty soon, and I think they're, they're the, the penny is starting to drop. That actually they can't be as fussy as they were a year ago. All right, cool. I look forward to seeing that. And if you guys, uh, you know, obviously should be subscribed to Paul. I don't know if you're not. You need to get your head red, but, you know, get over there and uh, get uh, get subbed up, you know, Paul Thorpe. Thank you, um, mate. Uh, what it, what it, I always mix it up, but it's Paul Thorpe Watch Dealer. Yeah. Right? Watch Paul dealer, Thorpe right? Watch Dealer, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know I, I kind of mess it up a little bit, but I always know how to find you, you know. Well, I'm, I'm subscribed, of course. That's um, good. All right, so we're ready to rock and roll. We'll get into this. Absolutely. Yeah, let's do it. So uh, it's kind of a preamble. Um, and, you know, I, I don't want to uh, pick on Steve, but a little bit of picking is going to happen here. Uh, people know that Paul and I have spoken and I have uh, I have been, as some people say, very defensive. Um, I wouldn't consider it defensive. I just want to have a conversation. Paul and I are friendly. Uh, I wouldn't say I've said this on the air and I don't mean to insult Paul. You know, I would say Nico and I are friends. Paul and I are friendly. We really don't know each other. Uh, other than outside of the shows. Um, we have our disagreements, Zero West being one of them, Steve Allen. So I don't mean to pick on you there, but no I want to kind of note that that uh, I'd like to be respectful, but I'm not a... Um, no, fine. What is it? No, no, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm not a simp for Paul. I like to be uh, respectful, right? Although he has a very dapper blazer on today. So with that, I'm going to do a little bit of introduction, right? And then we're going to turn into some questions and, and let these guys speak for themselves. The reason I want to do the introduction is that I've taken a lot of flack on a couple of shows for even mentioning this. So I want to bring up a couple of things for people. The link for Digital Watch Vault is pinned. I'm right. saying this very comfortably for a watch technology startup, of which there have been more than a couple. You can't find an FAQ or a privacy policy as thoroughly done for a first attempt on major sites in the watch industry today as you can on digital watch Wolf. okay so i want to start with that upfront kudos and i expect people Thank you. there's no possible way you're going to get everything you want and they are very open about email addresses for questions and they have a very extensive faq so the main site um you know is as you would expect is introduction there's some marketing we'll get into the blockchain uh you know the the, the value there any, uh, anything there all the memberships of four classes are free. Um, we'll touch on that again. Then they also have for those, and I have read this. Now, I don't read terms of service when I click through software all the time. I've read more than my fair share of privacy policies. They have a 27-page privacy policy that addresses GDPR, California Consumer Protection, a couple other things, the removal of your data, the type of data they may get, how they handle authentication, because currently and in the future, they're going to handle authentication through Google and meta platforms, so forth and so on. They put this out there, all this stuff needs work, but this is an impressive opening show for uh, a company that, you know, I don't know what the pedigree of say Stephen Bradley are, but this isn't like a meta company that has a fleet of lawyers, right? Um, so they have the privacy policy out there and it is very extensive and touches a ton of different things. And I have some questions on this as well, right? Um, they also have a FAQ and the FAQ has, is broken into five sections, covers a lot of stuff as well, including things like, do you have to provide your address? Which was one of the questions I got a lot of flack for the answer really short. No. Um, so the FAQ is pretty extensive. Again, they have email addresses to ask more questions. I have a feeling that they won't be opposed to expanding their answers because there's a lot of answers there already. And lastly, before I get into the questions, they also have testimonials. And the reason I want to pull this up 
not nobody's going to be happy about this who is already unhappy because there are people who have bones to pick with, say, producer Mike or Roman, right? I don't. There are certain people who do. But we have a lot of other people here from law enforcement and other companies that don't spend a lot of time on the YouTube and the YouTube controversies. And as much as, you know, we've got Spencer from BQ Watches, he's somebody a lot of us are familiar with. And as much as when we're in the streams, we like to act as though this is the whole watch world, YouTube live streams of Horology are like less than 1% of the watch world, right? Yeah. So it's interesting to see that they have people that are way outside of our purview. So I wanted to introduce with that because that's about as much, we got Alex in chat, perpetual time, no Spencer as well. Good to see you, Alex. That's about as much simping as I'm willing to do up front. I want to get into the questions, but I want to give them credit where credit's due. Go over to Chrono24 and a couple of sites, not to pick on Chrono24, use them. In terms of privacy policies, FAQs, this is one of the best I've seen and they just started. So with that, let's give them a fair shake. Let's get into some of the questions. Thank wow. you, Ali. Thank you. Okay, congratulations, Brad. <laughs> Brad worked hard, to be fair. Brad worked hard on pulling it together. Um, because I can't wait to talk about how this whole thing started and where it's evolved to now. You know, the, yeah, so the terms and conditions privacy policy, that was really a very important thing for Paul when we started this, that the members are really protected. So we, we put that at the top of our list to get done right. Yeah, and I think it's definitely something that's a lot of people are concerned about, right? Um, yeah. So we'll start there. A lot of people are, and I, I have a security background, so I have selection bias in all sorts of directions. People are uncomfortable giving things like serial numbers and their PII, right? And you do have privacy policy about PII, although you don't necessarily collect it all on day one, your privacy policy covers it, right? They they're, have concerns of handing that over. I also would say that people have a certain ignorance about how much of that is already handed over in the process of dealing with their ADs and watching Switzerland and stuff. And so people aren't completely aware of those things. Um, so that's one of the, the, the top concerns. So uh, I'm going to open with the security question. As a security guy, I've done for a lot of financials. My former firm, I'm, I'm semi-retired. We've done pen testing and attack simulations uh, annual. We've done uh, full malware simulations. We've simulated nation states, and we've done what are called attestations. Now, I didn't see an attestation on your website yet. So an attestation, for those who don't know, are there are two forms of attestation. There's an internal attestation, which is given to partners. So if you're a bank and you're partner with, say, American Express, or you're partner with FICO, which is a company, not just a credit score, but there's actually a company FICO, you will provide the attestation that you did all your pen tests. This is what they did. These were the results. This is what your remediation was to those partners. And then you'll also provide a public attestation, like a one-pager that says, these were the dates. Um, this was the firm. These are the people and the third-party audit firms that have reviewed the data. You don't necessarily provide the data but like KPMG has reviewed the data. Are there any plans in terms of when you hit a certain revenue right stream, right? You have enough money to do that level of uh, security work. Because currently on your FAQ, and I've read it, right? You do say that you have uh, an MSP, a managed security provider that is doing some monitoring, right? You don't say much more than that. So that could mean to somebody like me, you have a Cloudflare enterprise subscription, or it could mean you have retained Mandiant, right? So what does that mean? Steve or Brad, who wants to cover that? Well, uh, I'll jump in. And first of all, let me say, I am not a security background guy, but we have been working a lot with security. And the first thing we felt like we needed, Ali, is we needed to have a third-party security firm to handle and manage that stuff. So we do have a third-party security team. Um, we've got another guy who's got and who's part of the team who has 10 years plus experience in security and another who has five plus years experience in security. So we have a third party security team. And we felt like that was important because, Ali, you know, there are new hacking events happening all the time. What might have been popular last year is going to be new tomorrow. And so we're not in a, we're not keeping up with what those are, but the third party firm does. And so we're able to get notification alerts understanding what uh, type of patches, uh, what the vulnerabilities are in, in a regular basis. And so there's some things, though, that you mentioned that I think I'd love to have a conversation with you to figure out what that might mean down the road. But um, we're, we're three weeks in. We put a lot of thought uh, into security, a lot of thought, because we're dealing with um, we're dealing with uh, we're, we're trying to tackle an issue in the market with with um, stolen watch, watch theft. 
Um, we're trying to provide a platform to secure your watch's provenance. So security has always been a big thing. And um, I would say that we've got a pretty good grap uh, a grasp on what we're doing right now and we'll always learn and add more. I think, I think that's the answer that any new company would do, right? I mean, you've, you've started companies and you've had security. And as long as you put a foundation, you begin to build on that. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, what reading between the lines, what I just heard Steve say is that um, we have a security provider who's going to provide us threat intelligence, who's going to do vulnerability management for us, right? They're going to keep us abreast of the new TTPs, tool taxes, procedures, hackers use. This all sounds on paper good. Um, I think it's the best answer I can hope for on air because you aren't a security firm, right? One of the things that, that people, who consumers especially, like to do is they like to hold companies accountable for things that are not. And one of the things I have said to my clients over the years is I'm not expecting you to become a security firm. You sell a widget, but you do this or you do that, right? Security is a force multiplier, enabler, compliance, but it's not what you do. So fair enough, I think that's a, a reasonable answer. And as I've said on air before, Paul has invited me to look behind uh, uh, the curtains. I have not. Um, we are doing this completely neutral. Uh, if they let me look behind the curtains and make me sign a bunch of paperwork, I'll comply with what I feel comfortable with and I'll, I'll comply with anything I sign, but I will be open about that. If they make me sign paperwork that says I can't talk about it, I'm going to say it on JJ's show. So moving adjacently from security, one of the technical things that, that a lot of people, especially in JJ's audience, we have a lot of IT professionals in JJ's audience, is your use of the blockchain. Right. So the, a blockchain in and of itself and immutable transactions and a blockchain is a database that maintains transactional history over time. There's certain self-evident benefits to that, but it's not clear that a blockchain was necessary for this endeavor. So it feels to a lot of people, this is feedback we've gotten from the audience, that it is a uh, blinky light marketing ploy. Right. So whereas I could surmise many different good reasons to use a blockchain, what we'd like to know is why did you guys choose a blockchain, right? Are you built on as layer two contracts for an existing blockchain like Ethereum, or a little bit more about those details as much as you're you know willing to discuss? Yeah. So how about? Uh, and I want to answer the question. I uh, but but I think understanding why we built this platform will make sense. Why we chose to go and integrate blockchain? Because three years ago, Ali and JJ, I wanted to bring something into the marketplace you kind of alluded you don't know my background i have a marketing technology company and i wanted to i, I wanted to be like everybody else three years ago uh, mm -hmm. there was a big rise in the luxury watch space there are a lot of people jumping in in many different places i wanted to play a part in it and be a part and contribute to it but i didn't i didn't want to buy and sell watches so i wanted to uh, I, I just kept thinking what is it that i can contribute into the community and my passion is blockchain and a lot of companies were talking back then about blockchain and nfts and cryptocurrency and to me it was uh, it's just how do we make it really simple it's so confusing when you start thinking about blockchain and cryptocurrency and digital wallets and um metamask and converting crypto to i just wanted to find a very simple way to do one thing how can we document your watch's history on blockchain. Why blockchain? Because you can't tamper it. Once you put it in, and once it's in the data blocks connected with the chains, it's highly secure. You can't tamper it, uh, but it, you can you can share it, so it's visible, right? It's highly visible, but yet you can't uh, you can't edit, alter, or tamper. It made it, to me it made a lot of sense. I contacted Paul. Said Paul, here's my idea. Paul said, oh, that's a great idea. Here's my idea uh, with the whole thing about uh, security and lost and stolen watches. And we decided to bring the two together. So blockchain to me is a very important part of it. But I don't think we did a very good job explaining how the two work together because we don't use blockchain for security like, like um, or for lost and stolen watches. I've seen a lot of comments about why do you need the blinking light for a very simple lost and stolen database? We don't. Blockchain is a, is a great place so that you can document the history of your watch. And it's trustworthy because you can't go back in and, and change the odometer. You know what I'm saying? Like the data that's put in and time stamped, there's, there's uh, trust in that data. So yeah, we wanted to use blockchain to, to try to bring trust and looking at the history of the watch. I would rather buy a watch if I knew its history from birth to where it's at today than not knowing anything about the watch. So blockchain just seemed like a good idea. So 
Before I get into the nefarious question regarding the blockchain, you mentioned birth, so I'm going to touch on that one. Uh, Alex Perpetual Time had said this, and I've, I've said this. It seems to me that the, the golden goose here, like the ultimate use case here, is if manufacturers at birth of a watch enter the information in digital watch fall. And I believe you have two manufacturers, Zero West and, and Duckworth, that are potentially already doing that. That's already in their plans, right? And the idea there would be that the provenance of the watch and the ownership, along with the card, or along with maybe the NFTs that some watchmakers are doing for their own thing, digital watch vault comes along with it, which then also ties into, for people who hopefully will eventually read the FAQ, some of the prescribed policies for one watch is lost, right? You go to digital watch vault, you log in, you download the information about your provenance, and you provide that to the authorities as well. See, I did read the FAQ. Um, <laughs> so... What are the, you know, how do you anticipate getting more watch vendors on? Because as we've said on JJ Show before, Richmond Group, right, has uh, their own competitor. Then you also have people like Louis Vuitton and Chanel and Cartier. They have their own <clears> internal <throat> blockchain beast competitor, right? How do you get these people to play nice with you? Can I answer that one, being the what, being the what's guy? Um, Ali, first of all, um, Jacob and Co are all signed up with us, also signed up with us. So that's our Jacob first, and Jacob and Co. I can confirm that. So they are our big stellar signing, if you like. Um, the answer, the honest answer to that question is um, slowly. It's going to happen slowly. Now, you've mentioned the Inquirers, Richmond, et cetera. Where obviously, we're fully aware of what these people are doing. And a lot of what I say, guys, anyone watching out this now, I'm not the technical one. Someone was saying about, would they trust Thorpe to build blockchain? And Steve, what did you say from <laughs> behind your hand? He's not smart enough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just the watch guy, right? Um, but what I will say, Ali, is that we honestly have had an unbelievably positive reaction from every single person that we've spoken to within the industry itself. No, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that we're on the verge of signing up Rolex. No, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that we're on the verge of signing up Patek Philippe. Not yet. But I think that if the community works together on this one, bearing in mind that my view right from the very start, and Steve will, will tell you the same thing from our many private conversations, that my view from the very, very start of this was to try and unite everyone. And the only way that we can unite everyone is if we're united ourselves. This is our chance. I, Ali, I see this as our chance. That's everyone on this on this uh, panel, in the chat, whether you like me, whether you don't like me, it's all irrelevant. This is the Watts community's baby. That was my vision. That was my belief. Um, and I still believe that today. I'd also like to throw in, um, Ali, when we, when we set forth, we didn't set forth thinking how do we bring on the watch manufacturers nor the watch dealers our first focus was the watch the individual watch the owner mm -hmm. and if we, it, we in a way we can force change in a way by um adopting things like if i'm going to buy a watch from a watch dealer or a watch manufacturer is it is it is its history started in blockchain it would be great if it was the vault so are we would we like to see watch manufacturers put the watch in at ground zero absolutely but we thought this through how does the individual who bought a watch five years ago how do they how do they start how do we begin that process so yeah we'd love to see the watch manufacturers involved down the road but right now our primary interest and concern is for the individual watch owner all of that will happen slowly like paul said yeah. but if if um you know we built this out of lab a labor of love um this whole thing is how do we make a difference and provide value into the watch industry, the watch community? So yeah, it's, it's really more starting with the individual first. But I think it's a great question. I think that's something that everybody wants to know. And fortunately, some of the watch uh, manufacturers who've been taking a look have an interest. Can I, can I also add, Ali, can I also add, and maybe JJ, you might want to come in on this one as well, mate. I mean, sure. look, I look at it this way. All, all of these groups, they all have their own lost and stolen lists. They all have their own bits and pieces, but none of them actually really talk to each other, and certainly none of them talk to us. Rolex don't even... We're so unimportant to Rolex Geneva 
that they don't even make the lost and stolen register available to us that could potentially save our watches from getting stolen, help us retrieve them. They've discovered one of mine and I can't even get the goddamn thing back. The bottom line is this, and I'm very passionate about this. All they care about is our money. We are the first people that have come along into the watch community and said, we care about everyone, whether it be Rolex right down to brands like Zero West, Christopher Ward, whoever you want to, whoever you want to name. We have no bias. We are the Switzerland, or we're trying to be, we want to be the Switzerland of the watch world, completely neutral. Everyone is welcome. This is our family. Let's build it together. Let's put ourselves in a position of power. Instead of the companies always being in that position of power, instead of Rolex holding that lost and stolen database so that some poor guy tomorrow goes into the diamond district in New York and buys a stolen watch, some poor soul goes in the Hatton Garden in London tomorrow and buys a watch and finds out it's stolen. We are trying to put an end to that. And I think, we, can, we can only yeah. do it together. I think uh, I just want to touch on one point. I think you make a good point as far as like if you think about it in, in like law enforcement terms, right? It's like a fractured system. You know, you, you know, this guy did something in this state or country. Exactly. and but th there's no you know this is a, a good way no for communication. Like a global communica a global communication exactly where you could you know the thing is you got to get it to a where you can reach a tipping point right where people have no choice but to sign up right like you get a jacob call and this one and like and then, and then the next company and the thing is other companies who are resistant at first now they don't want to miss out they don't want to be the one not doing this because customers start to say like hey why aren't you taking care of us here? Why aren't you making exactly. sure I'm not buying, you know, exactly. stolen watches? JJ, you know, look, I don't want to give our way out any of our long-term plans, um, you know, but there is going to come a time when we're, we're going to be asking the question, how much do you care? Do you care about your customers? Do you care about our community? Which brands care? Which brands really don't care? Right. Um, and we've, and got a lot, we've got a lot of brands stepping forward right now saying we want to be a part of this. I think that's a, that's a pretty um, normal conclusion that, like, I mean, at least, and I'm a layman as far as, like, when you guys are talking about the technicals, I don't know what's going on, but I do know I would expect as you going forward as a company to, to be approaching these companies who aren't getting involved with that rationale, like, hey, yeah. what are you doing? <laughs> like, so-and-so is in, this guy's in, do you want to be relevant anymore? Like, you know, you better get with it. Um so I, I definitely see what, what you're saying there. And we haven't, um, we haven't, it, we haven't even. I mean, Steve, uh, Steve, Steve's really passionate about this, and I love the way he talks about it. Steve, can you tell the guys a little bit more about how that lost and stolen register works for for our for our members, for for members of our digital watch folk? Tell them how it works and the potential benefits of it. Yeah. So, um, and Ali, this is going to uh, some of the questions you asked us earlier about privacy. It all fits together. So if I reported a watch as lost or stolen in our registry, which by the way, there's no cost to any of this. And then a watch dealer or somebody was about to purchase a watch, they ran the watch through the, the uh, registry and it came up as a member reported this watch is stolen. Then at that moment, me being the searcher, a pop-up message will pop up and say, do you want to send an anon anonymous message to the person who reported this watch is stolen? So through our intra messaging system, I can send a message and saying, hi, my name is Steve Allen. Your watch showed up in my shop. Um, I know you reported it stolen. Here's my number if you want to contact me, things like that. We just want to make it to where, and that happens immediately. We want to make it to where if a watch has been reported as lost or stolen and somebody discovers it, that we want the communication to, to bang happen immediately so that we can start maybe helping in the recovery, maybe slowing down uh, how quick, um, you know, how easy it is to sell a watch, a, a stolen or lost watch in the market or things like that. So, and the key I think about that whole thing is the anonymity that still is held within those conversations. So, yeah, it's. And now that customers can customer call the local police department and say, hey, my watch is in your community, and at least they now have a connection, they can send a blockchain report with all the details and start to, you know, start the process. Well, right, I'm going to turn, there's police, there were a couple things you just touched on. I'm going to go, I'm going to touch the earlier question or earlier thing. I'm going to seed this idea for Steve or Bradley. One of the things I concerned about, right, with blockchain and as a 
company who's assessed a couple of companies that are blockchain and cryptocurrency centric um, is the blockchain being immutable also has the byproduct of it is very easy to pollute a blockchain with excess and unusable data. Then application layer, right, um, has to filter that out. So what happens, and this is something that, again, we may talk about later, I decide I'm going to register hundreds upon hundreds of watches I don't own because I know their serial number, which is not that hard to come by in some cases, right? And I've now created a miniature denial of service within your platform, right? Or I'm a backpack dealer in a controversy with, say, Anthony Fair, Paul, and we're going back and forth and registering and reporting things as stolen. Digital Watch Vault becomes then a kind of battleground for bad actors who are trying to provide a denial of service or people in a dispute. How is Digital Watch Vault going to deal with that? Or even the saboteur, right? Someone who just doesn't like your company might, yeah. might want to do that. You know, oh, yeah. I guess that's bad actor, right? <laughs> Same yeah. Brad, Brad, do you want to do you want to touch on that one? Because I know that there's some areas there that I'm not qualified to talk about, but I do know there are some sensitive areas there that obviously we're aware of. Uh, well, we uh, uh, we built a system where when the first picture of the watch is uploaded, it has to be set to a certain time of day that's random and produced by the platform. So the first image of the watch, the user has to look and see, okay, is that time matched to the to the time that the blockchain record says it should be matched to? Um, but I'd, I'd like for Steve to kind of give a couple analogies. Um, he has some pretty good uh, stories on how the platform is used this way. Well, no, it's not really the story. It's just like, what did we build this for? We didn't build it to authenticate who put in the watch or authenticate the watch. We put it as a tool that you can document your watch's history on the blockchain. Now, Ali, we have things in place that you're not going to put 100 watches in. It is free, but we watch the data coming in. And if you hit a certain thresholds and there's a warning sign whenever you whenever you go to register a watch, we're going to limit your initial and then we'll give you permission to add more as we get to know who you are and and what, what are you putting in so we never set out um per se to do what you're talking about doing we wanted it to be a platform that you're going to document your watch's data on so we have some some cross references that if somebody reported a watch is stolen and somebody tried to add that watch then we'll get some notifications to know what happened and and we have some processes in place on how do we resolve that? Uh, it, but it, it goes back to a, a accountability of the person that's putting in the data. So sure, accountability of the person, though, right? The good actors aren't. You never have to worry about good actors. You also described application layer controls, but the controls, and you never said specifically, nor do you have to answer the question: Is it a, if it's a private blockchain? It's a private blockchain. Like what the blockchain is based on resolves your contracts. But talking to the blockchain versus going through application controls are two different things. I can interact with the Bitcoin blockchain um, through applications and it puts transaction data. I could also interact with blockchain directly and upload ASCII art, which I have done to torment people to my heart's content. <laughs> right. So, yeah. so, and, and that's a question that we, I don't know, I want to seed it and maybe that's something we take offline. Right. But I think that bad actors for a system that is meant for good actors, always need to be readily anticipated mm. because it's the good it, the, the the problem in especially such a charged discussion and one where there's a lot of profit in fakes right there's a lot of profit in fakes right and did you watch all as your faq says you don't get in the authentication business right but you touched on something that i know if i don't ask certain people in the audience are going to lose their mind on i said this to paul before you everything's free you got four classes of users it's free your privacy policy you say no we don't sell your data but that ultimately means still we're the product one way or another because we're not giving you anything other than some data but you're not selling the data so you have to advertise to us there's revenue streams you've got partnerships with two insurance companies so far what is the monetization model because if you don't have one you don't survive right and you're not taking paid memberships from dealers and dealerships and stuff like that and if you don't have one and you get to the point where you're starting to not survive one day we might get that email that says our terms of service and our privacy policy is changing, opt out by X date. And now, now it's up to us to reclaim through GDPR or California Consumer Protection, or our data now becomes for sale, right? That's a, that's a real feeling that people have. So what is, is that monetization model? 
Yeah, it's a real feeling. So we we did an equity raise. We have investors. We've raised money to get the project started. Um, our ongoing costs come in the form of advertisers. So we have, if it makes sense for a particular watch related business or service to advertise within, then they're going to be invited to advertise on the different pages in the platform. We've also got potentially if there's some money that comes in on the insurance, but really uh, this is, I think one of the things people are wondering about, like how can you put all of this stuff on blockchain? Oh, we use Polygonmatic. Polygonmatic is a lesser priced um, platform of putting on uh, data on the blockchain. We're not building NFTs. We're not going on that expensive route of it. Uh, and we created a it's a it's a, a patent pending process that we can make it so we're not trying to exchange crypto to uh, uh, to tokens and in that typical process of what others have tried to do in the past. It's really simple. You sign up, you register your data on the blockchain and bang, it's on the blockchain. We make it very simple to do that. But there's not a big cost behind doing that. Right. It's it's not what traditionally we think of how much it costs to put data on the blockchain. It's it's just not. So we're, our costs are kept low. What we've uh, put together the team is properly as we're growing. And uh, our revenue is going to come is coming in from our advertisers. So I think it's a really fair question because I think some people thought we we're naturally just sh sharing data. We're not sharing data. We, we even the amount of personal data that we collect is very little name, email, phone number. So um it it is what it is we had investors we have um a revenue coming in from our advertisers and the advertisers are very specific on who it makes sense to bring into the watch community so for those who were listening closely uh steve i think kind of inadvertently also answered the question of the blockchain uh, matic is polygon's version of ethereum gas fees so Matic is the way the Polygon DApps environment works. It sounds like you're built on Polygon. Um, mm -hmm. Again, I had nothing to do with that decision. So some of the crypto nerds out there, don't ask me. It wasn't my call. Um, the uh, So you're going to have those revenue chains. And what about the savings? Oh, right? You have the partnership with the insurance companies. They're advertising. Okay. But how close are we seeing our insurance companies like Chubb giving us a discount if we're registered on Digital Watch? Can I answer that? Yeah, it's as soon as you guys all adopt it and sign up good answer. you know you know because listen guys, what's adoption looking like so far paul what are the numbers I thought, uh, I, honestly i can tell you that and, and and i i steve how blown away are we by the adoption yeah i mean it's uh for, it's a, for a soft launch it's this is a soft launch we're not in a full launch we're just in a soft launch uh, and a lot of it is in paul thorpe's um community and we're getting lots of feedback um, so yeah, we're still in a soft launch, but it's going very well. But Ali, just going back to that question, mate. I mean, the bottom line is, Ali, we have so much planned for everyone. We have so much planned. We want to achieve so much. We want to do so much. We want to we want to achieve so many good things in this business, in this community, for the good of everyone. Whether it be the safety and security of your person, the safety and security of your watch, whether it be potentially getting a discount from manufacturers, potentially getting discounts for insurance, preferential rates. We can achieve all that, but only we can only achieve it together. And someone someone needed, someone had to come along and have the balls and have the the will and the courage and, the, and, and, and everything else that it takes to do what we've achieved. Someone had to come along and do this, to grab it by the scruff of the neck and say, we're going to try and make a difference. And that's what we've done. That's what I, think the be I think the be the beginning, or well, obviously, like most things, the beginning is always the most difficult po point part until you get to that specific point where Critical it mass. becomes like everyone has to get on and get involved. Um, so I, I, I think you know, it's going to take a, a long time to get to, well, maybe not a long time, but it's going to take a while to get to where you want. But then the rest will probably come quite a bit easier, like all those discounts and things. People will want to get involved once they see you have the numbers and you know the interest um, yeah i'm going to tell you two little tales if, if, if it's all right if you don't mind right sure two, two little tales right first of all we've been on this now for almost three years steve right yeah and when we initially started speaking to people about our ideas it was like oh yeah okay you know no no interest no no enthusiasm for what we're doing 
we are now not batting people away because we will never bat anyone away, but we are now struggling to keep up with the amount of inquiries that we're getting from people who want to get involved because they love what we're doing. They can see what we're doing. They get it. The other thing that I want to talk to you about is I put my watches, or I've started to put my watches in the vault myself. And I can truthfully say from the bottom of my heart, the tangible feeling of extra security once I've done it, knowing that if my watches went missing, I've still got everything that I have in my own private vault that no one can get to, no one can steal from me. That is my proof. That is my provenance. Because right now, JJ, if someone was to steal the watch from your wrist right now, I'm going to ask you guys a question now. If your watch was stolen right now, what would you do? What's the first thing that you'd do? I file the police report and I call insurance. That's my risk right. model. I don't right. ever expect to see the watch come back. Ali, that's a great question. But a lot of, and you, you're doing things correctly, but not everyone does it that way, sadly. Now, the bottom line is this. Is that I think even if you were covered, would you still not want to see the guy that stole it apprehended? This is, so this is one of these things going back to Paul and I were friendly, but like I have no bias here. So I don't know if I'm convinced the Digital Watch Vault's risk model is suitable for me because I don't expect to get my watch back. Now, this goes to the adoption problem. If adoption is prevalent enough, then the likelihood of getting your watch back increases. So sure, right? But then there's another problem that Bradley kind of touched on this, right? Is, or he, he, he grazed it, is that law enforcement agencies, especially in the US, of which I'm familiar with, both federal and at state level, they operate wildly differently. Oh, so yeah. there's certain law enforcement agencies of the US that are su su substantially big enough that they have liability models that using digital watch fault might not even be an option for them, right? Now, individual detectives or whatnot, they have the option of going and Googling and registering for services. But in terms of integrating that into their evidentiary chain, it might not be an option for them. Now, you have endorsements from certain law enforcement agencies in the UK already, and you guys are headquartered out of Los Angeles, is my understanding. So clearly you have some fabric. So I, do, what, do I care if the person's apprehended? Kind of. But since I don't think it's likely right now, I don't care that much because it would drive me crazy thinking about it. Would it I think my main be concern nice? would be getting my re refunded either my money or my watch. Primarily, uh, I mean, that, but I get what you're saying, but I think that's way secondary to get it recovery, in my opinion. Here's the thing is that also, if, if everyone adopts the vault, the chances of someone stealing your watch in the first place, we believe, because is ultimately going to be dramatically reduced. Therefore, yeah. potentially saving you from going through through that traumatic experience. Um, but once, the, once, I, I actually, it's a shame we can't do a demo right now for you on screen because if you could see how quick the process is, my, the point I was getting to is that JJ, right now, if you had your watch stolen already, you've told me what the process would be. But in future, we're hoping that the process is is that the moment that watch goes, you pick up your phone. Our web-based apps are, uh, sorry, our apps are due out before too long. Right now we're web-based, but you can get on your phone, you can type in your loss, and by the time that bad guy gets to the local pawn shop on the corner, no more than a mile away, that's already going to flag on his system. That is yeah. the quickest, safest, best yeah. system in the world. There is no other system that compares to that. that would and be the analogy is sure. the the current, oh wait, let's get Patel. Let's get the super yeah, chat. So we got these up for quite a while. Let's uh, we we'll get a couple of these here. We got Patel Philippe. Thank you very much. Twenty dollars Canadian. He says Thorpe was talking to a dealer friend. Someone bought a Daytona, sent it to Rolex Service Center for service. Rolex returned the watch to the person with an invoice labeled "stolen watch." Very strange from Rolex Service Center not to confiscate. I know the answer to that. It depends. I'd like to know what country that was in because some countries, they the Rolex won't get involved with the law, if the middleman. They just go, this is stolen. You deal with it. We're not getting involved in the middle. But it, I've heard of it before. It is unusual, but I have heard of it. Let us know what country in the chat, uh, Tan, and uh, I can pull it up while we get this next one. I've yeah. known that to happen in the UK. No, we'll see. Maybe he says uh, he'll let us know in the chat where it was. It could possibly be there. And then we got our friend JBJB JB with 12 euros. He says, sorry, maybe this was answered already. 
I apologize. Is there a statistic that shows what happens when the watch is stolen? Does it go to a private buyer or a business from a percentage standpoint? I'm not quite sure. Like, where do the watches go when they're stolen? Right. What He's saying, the, like, what's the percentage of it goes to a pawn shop? What's the percentage oh. it just goes to a person? Or, you know, is there any data on that? No. No, no, no reliable data. I mean, we, we, we can take a guess, um, but there's no reliable data to say what percentage of stolen watches end up in pawn shops or in or back with pre-owned dealers or on eBay. Not really. and that, that could actually be data that you might be able to harvest um, with the with the app itself or, you know, or with the product itself, I should say. Absolutely. You know, you'll know like oh, this. They tried to sell it in this pawn shop. Maybe that could keep record. They tried to sell it to this individual. They tried to sell it to this, uh, yeah. you know, watch shop. Uh, so Tan says it was in Canada that for the last uh, chat yeah. that they did that. Yeah, it doesn't involved. surprise me that actually Canada. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we met so, with um, some. Uh, Department of Justice uh, people here in the States, and they're, they are having right now a massive crime wave coming in from Chile, where they fly into Miami, they spread out their cars, steal watches all over the country, and then fly back out just with all their watches. And it's uh, they said it's one of the greatest operations they've seen, how fast they get in and out, in and out of a home and then consolidate and leave the country. Uh, but they don't have a solution um, in law enforcement, like you say, that, that one county talks to another county, let alone one state talking to the federal government. Uh, so when we talk with law enforcement, they are thrilled about what, what we're doing. And they're, uh, they're fine. Yeah, I spoke to somebody myself who, who was talking to me about how difficult automobiles are. And automobiles are, mm -hmm. I mean, like, they are tracked from VIN numbers, insurance, every transfer, port. Like, it's an immense amount of tracking for automobiles, right? And it's still difficult between yeah. state yeah. jurisdictions to actually communicate with law office. So, so a couple things, right? Um, the analogy of the adoption issue, right? The, for the audience, I thought about this, and I thought about this in, in Costco and other things. You have ring doorbells, right? So ring doorbells initially uh, were an interesting thing. Some cloud storage got the video. And then the ring neighborhood features started coming out, which were kind of a bit of a nightmare for people. People didn't want to get involved in neighborhoods. Neighbors, right? Neighbors, you know, they felt like there was a privacy issue there. And then ring started providing footage you could opt out of it right but they started providing footage to local law enforcement there's a certain point where i'm not saying this is right or wrong from a privacy standpoint i don't like getting involved in those things but there's a certain point where adoption then starts changing the cost and security models of everything and in this case the ring model or the fire extinguisher model in homes or apartments applies if there's enough adoption then the 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 what happens is insurance companies start giving you discounts for the adoption, right? Because they start recovering more. And I think Bright Blue Comet, a uh, uh, channel member, you know, he has said, um, I'm going to pull up his comment, right? Yeah. Why is it insufficient? If we do insurance, why is it insufficient? And I think it's not an issue of being insufficient. It's an issue of it's a force multiplier, I think, if there's not enough adoption. But then Bright Blue Comet, to your point, will people like us adopt it if we're already, and I just said it earlier on air, if I'm already depending on insurance, will I even adopt it? Um, right. Now, I've already obligated to Paul, and because I feel comfortable, uh, we'll go to Mr. Zoso's comment next, right? I will be doing a separate video of a live enrollment, protecting my PII, and actually enrolling uh, three of my watches in Digital Watch Vault to get an idea of the experience um, and the future apps. I know Android and, and iPhone apps are coming. So, yeah, name, email, phone number is actually a tremendous amount of data, and Turkey has some very, very odd laws beyond GDPR about, like, email. On the flip side, as a father of a teenager, opt right or wrong, the whole school system and everything in the school system takes my name, phone number, email, whether I want it or not. Like it's given out all the time. So that's not like the hill I choose to die on. It's a risk model thing sort of stuff, right? Then uh, we had somebody else who asked one of the questions that I put in my proposed questions to JJ. Um, the So uh, the vetting process, you guys actually talk about a vetting process for law enforcement on your FAQs, again, I read the FAQs. I didn't see a vetting process for dealers. Absolutely. Think about the, uh, so in, in, the, in the history of the watch, the data that, that, we're, um, that you're putting on the blockchain, the only time a watch is um, verified as authentic is when a watch dealer is in part of its process. And that's the accountability part. So they, 
if they're selling us watches, we're, I mean, they're, they're selling us authenticated watches. So in the process, when a watch dealer puts a watch in, they verify, they're asked a question. Do you verify this watch is authentic? Yes, no. And that's, that's covered in that blockchain certificate tied into their name, tied into the, who they are. The watch dealer is also the only person who can uh, report a counterfeit watch. So we have to vet them out. You, if, if a watch, when a watch dealer signs up, um, they have access to the platform, but they can't add watches to the blockchain. They can't report lost or stolen watches and they can't report counterfeit watches until we give them that access. And we're working through processes right now. We're contacting them. So we're working process on how we vet them out. So it's not a blind vetting. Not anybody is going to just sign up as a watch dealer because of some of the data that they can put in in the history of the watch. We have to do things like that, Ali. I, 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 can I just answer back? I'm sorry, I'm jumping back to your question on, um, you know, why? Why report a stolen watch? Uh, and it does have to do with adoption. But right now, b before we before we really worked on this, I, I would go to a Facebook group and I would see, see something like, hey, guys, here's a picture of my watch. is a serial number and I it was stolen. Like, that's what they adopted. That, that's really one of the primary ways that people were saying I, my watch was stolen. So we just want to provide a better way, a little more secure way, and a way that's eventually going to tie into how law enforcement and insurance companies can access the data as well. I have my, I have my history of the watch document on blockchain. My watch was stolen. I reported it to the community. It popped up somewhere. They sent me an, an anonymous message. I took that offline because I'm comfortable with it. And maybe I had some closed caption TV data or something to help me recover. it. Like it's all a process. It's an ecosystem that we're trying to figure out. Can it grow it, better? It's a, Absolutely. It's an interesting, it's an interesting ecosystem as well because there's actually two cost models involved. We've already talked about the insurance one extensively, but the other one is law enforcement. The success of law enforcement in recovering or prosecuting these things is a revenue stream for them as well, or a justification of their taxpayer dollars, stuff like that as well. So it's actually that revenue model as well. So adoption would drive that, and obviously adoption is kind of a chicken and egg situation. Now, to the point of adoption, and I think I may have asked Paul this question, um, why are, you know, or, well, maybe you are, uh, forget Rolex, because Rolex doesn't care about anybody. Right. I think Rolex is only second to Breguet about not caring about their customers. Um, watches are Switzerland. Massive. Huge. They could register everything at time of sale. Right. Are we, is that the ticket? Is that something that, you know, we need to go? Because I would, I, I legitimately, and I'm saying this, I legitimately would be much more keen on this service if it was something that was done for me at point of sale. Right, because that's what we point. want. Okay. Sorry, Ali, that's what we want our dealers to do. We want our dealers to register at the point of sale, guaranteeing authenticity in a blockchain so that they can't say. Let me give you an example of a bad dealer. You buy a watch from a dealer, he sells you the watch, you take it away. Two weeks later, you discover the dial's fake, or you discover that the bracelet's fake. That dealer has committed. 100% to what he sold you. It's there, it's pictured, it's photographed, it's timestamped. He can't then say, that's not what I sold you. That's not what you bought. That's not what I told you. He's, our dealers are going to be committing to transparency and to absolute honesty as to what they're selling. We're going to get some pushback from some dealers, is my guess. Right, because why would they want to be on the hook as the point of origin, exactly. right? It's like, so you, know, we're, you really we're, need we're, an upstanding dealer to do that. Exactly. So we're looking for our dealers to be accountable. We're trying to make the dealers more accountable. This is where people say, oh, you're just a friend of the grey market. Listen, I'm trying I'm trying to help. We are trying to help everyone. And I go back a little bit to what you said earlier on, Ali, about, you know, your coverage, your whole. I don't mean this personally for you. It's just an analogy. But that's a little bit like saying that, well, I got attacked on the way home, but I'm all right, so I'm not going to report it. We have a responsibility to other members of the community. Now, if you're, if you, if you, if a lot of you're not wrong, Paul. I, yeah. I, you're not wrong because the thing is that my stolen watch, like I have three APs, that's over a hundred thousand dollars, right? 
those three APs, if I don't report them stolen properly, if they don't come to bear on who has stolen that, that's $100,000 that can be yes. used towards, yep. as we covered on JJ show, can be used towards other crime, terrorism, and human trafficking. We exactly. actually had an episode on this. Yeah. So you're wow. not wrong. Right? It's a snowball of crime. Yeah. I know you're not wrong. I'm just saying that, like, in my day to day life, no offense to Paul, Steve, or Brad, Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we get I'm it. just going to call Chubb and, and be made whole. Like, well, yeah, call, call, the call the Chubb. Get made whole. Right? But, but the other thing that you're able to do, when you make that report, we have a crime hotspot map. So it's a live interaction that every time a crime is reported, it pops up in on the Google Maps. So you're able to go in and look to see what, what crimes happened in this location that I'm about to travel in the last week. And you start seeing the hot spots where mm. the, these crimes are reported and happening. So it's it's more than just reporting your loss of stolen watch and you hope it gets recovered. It's going to the community and letting them know this event just happened. Don't go into this particular part of London because there, there's this. It's a hot spot. Things are happening. So Things that's what I keep saying. Right. It's all about the adoption. And we want it to get better. Can it get better? Sure, it can get better. But um, I know one of the comments in the chat was, how are we going to get people to keep going back to the sites? Things like the crime hotspot. Go check out to see where the latest crimes are. Go check out the latest data about the crime that we've that we've captured, that the members are putting in there. It's not our data. It's what the members are putting out there. So, And I think if you uh, travel a bit, that's very useful. Um, like I would know if I'm going, like, let's say I'm in New York and I'm, not that that's probably a hot spot itself, but let's say I'm going to LA and I want to see, is it active? See, because the thing is, right, thing, I mean, just my own kind of sense of it is crimes kind of happen in waves, right? When yeah. people are out and when they get caught, it cools off. That's how I've always seen crime. Like, there's been points where I live in New York where, you know, people are robbing cars like crazy, but eventually those people get caught. And when they stop, it's not like the next one just slots right in. Like it's it's a thing. You're either doing that type of activity or you're in prison or you come back out and you're doing it again or you're, you know what I mean? So it kind of comes in waves. So it is good to see, get some real time data like what's going on in L.A. right now. Is it really hot right now? Are people out every day, you know, or did that cool off? Was that maybe a month or two ago and now it's kind of cooled off? Why? Maybe they got caught. Who knows? You know, but um. I have, I have I have I have on my other computer there a two hour conversation between myself and a, a detective at Scotland Yard um, that I'm trying to get permission to make some of it public. A lot of it is sensitive information and it, it's definitely not going to be allowed to be made public. But I've applied for portions of it to be made public. And this is where we're having so much success feeding into law enforcement around the world because when we find these points of contact and they understand what we're doing and how we can help them um, identify these hotspots and patterns, and they are very, very interested because, as Ali said, it's not just about the watch theft. It's not just where does that money go? What other um, criminal organizations is that money being it, what, it, what is that funding in some areas we we're told not that i've had any experience of this whatsoever but one police uh, uh police official told me that they had a belief that certain areas of this was was, was funding terrorism so you know there there is a bigger picture and that's why i think that so many of our points of contact in the police have been so keen and it's very welcoming yeah, you know, one of the facts in the episode I did on, on counterfeits and, and whatnot, I, I did an episode, one of the facts that caught a lot of soft guard, and this is one that I remember hearing about years ago, was the first attempt at the World Trade Center bombing, which were the vehicles parked in the parking garage, failed attempt, was nearly fully funded by the sale of counterfeit t-shirts on the same street as Crazy. the World Trade Center. Crazy. Right? And well, yeah, I've that, seen those now, places. They're in the buildings right up there. You go in there, all the fake you know football jerseys that are three hundred dollars you know mitchell and snl i'm going back to when that happened when you know those were super popular or you know designer jeans that are two hundred dollar a pair and this is you know again going back 20 some years ago you know you can pick them up 50 60 bucks they're yeah. making them very similar and people used to you you know how you would tell oh, well at least if you knew the blue bags when you seen people coming out with the big blue bags that's where you knew with the spots to go get those items for cheap and all that they always said that's all you know funding pretty much yeah. you know illegal activities in one way or another i mean look, so I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not going to sit here and say that you know 
we're trying to save the world. But what I'm saying is that ultimately we we do appreciate the bigger picture, and so do the, when we speak to uh, police departments, um, they are pretty, they're actually the ones that have put those those thoughts in our mind more than we've put it in theirs. Yeah, and actually, so I know somebody who I believe he's actually tuned in as of five o'clock. I knew he said it was going to be late, and I'm sure I'm going to get a WhatsApp or a signal message from him later. Um, I have a, a friend in law enforcement who's dealing with uh, repeat watch crime in the greater Tampa area, who's very interested to see this conversation because there's a systemic problem, right? And an individual, if I report a stolen watch in my rural area while outside of Tampa, Honestly, the detective's not going to care. They're going to ask if we have insurance and it's yeah. going to go on a file and that's it. Yeah. But if it becomes a systemic issue and there's been seven or eight in the same neighborhood, right? And it's robberies, but there's a luxury watch at each one. Then they start caring because that's yeah. the lead that can put an yeah. end to a systemic yeah. issue. So before I get to my last question, because we're coming up to the hour, and then there will be you know, a free for all for you guys if you want to stay, if you want to go, wherever you want, and we'll invite other panel members on. I want to address a question that came up in the chat a couple of times. Um, is the trusted dealer network, you know, Paul has a trusted dealer network. I don't know if Paul wants to disclose who's enrolled. However, in the testimonial section of the website, which I pulled up earlier, there are at least six dealers um, and uh, names that I think a lot of us know who have put their trusted testimonials up there. And Roman Sharp has actually been on board as uh, and said he's an early adopter um, on the show. He's actually said that. Uh, so to answer that question, and my last question, and Surdy, Danny, and I are on the same wavelength, and this was always going to be my last question. Mm -hmm. I don't trust somebody who does something like this and doesn't have a profit motive, because I think that person's either too naive, right, or they, they put fancy themselves Fidel Castro. So <laughs> what's the last one? That's a little rough. Either they're naive problem. or they fancy themselves Fidel Castro. Right? Oh. Why, why I don't know why you'd say that. I mean... <laughs> Well, I, and I see there's a lot of comments of saying, I, uh, Red, I'd like to, I prefer to pay for this type of service. Um, why is this for free? I mean, it's like six and one half a dozen the other. We can go down the road, and I've built other companies as well. We can go down the road and we can create a uh, model that um, we're going to charge people. In fact, when we first started this, mm -hmm. that's what Paul and I, uh, let, let's, let's figure out what the cost is and how do we charge individuals to add their data to the blockchain. And there's others out there that are doing it. There's other watch registries for lost and stolen watches that are charging quite a bit just to add a watch or to do a search. And we didn't want to do any of that. And I don't know why we keep getting beat up for not doing that. Can, we, I, can I jump into your defense here somewhat, even though like I'm kind of whatever, I'll go back and forth on you know what I think about it. I just want to say, we, of course, sure. we're going to make money to keep this thing going. It's a it's a passion play for the long term. It's not a short term type deal. Yeah. And it's only going to be as good as the, the community adopts. Someone said, how are you going to get people to keep coming back if they're going to be advertisers? Crime Hotspot was just one of many examples. So mm -hmm. we're constantly evolving, trying to think, how do we, we bring value to the people who are spending money on advertising? How do we bring value to the free memberships that are using? How do we bring value that if you added your watch to the blockchain at no cost? And, and yes, we're going to make this a, um, a sustainable long-term business. It's not pie in the sky. Um, it started from a, you know, you'll hear this say a lot, and I'm sorry, I got real passionate about the whole thing. JJ, no. Ali, you'll hear us say a lot that it's a, it's a labor of love. Mm -hmm. No, it, it's now a business. There's a business model behind it because it's become way bigger than creating a cute little app that you can add your watch to. It's way bigger than that, guys. It's having conversations with law enforcement on how do we create uh, a way that this data becomes valuable to you if if in your area in Tampa there's a stolen watch. How do we get you notified? Insurance companies. I mean, it's it's bigger because it, we hope it is meeting a need and it'll continually to evolve. Well, th this is my interpretation, and you could correct me if I'm wrong. Like. I don't think you're doing this out of the goodness of your heart. If I was doing this, if this was my app, right? This is an egalitarian effort. Right. This, this is just my my thinking. I'm offering it free for one reason and one reason only. Your most important hurdle is getting past that threshold of users, right? So I want I don't want to create a barrier of entry. I want, I want it to be as frictionless as possible. You come in, you sign up, you're in. No fee, no nothing, nothing to think about. Down the road, however, once we cross that threshold and I have the dealers and I have the watch companies in, now I provide you an extra service where it's now you can be a paid mem premium member or you can be, and I'm not saying you're doing this. I'm just spitballing what I would be doing as this company. So my 
initial reaction is I think it would be smarter to create free memberships for everyone. It's not nefarious. It's actually you, it's what you should be doing to cross that threshold of having the amount of users you need to make it, you know, a popular app or a popular. And they don't even um, know what their cost model product. is yet, right? They don't know what their infrastructure costs really are yet at scale. So they don't even know if there's a freemium model in here. But, like I think a lot of people who comment no, no, on no, this no, thing, no, 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 no. We do know what our cost model is. We're not, we're not that blind into the whole process. We know. No, what you know what it is right now, but you don't know what it is once you have certain adoption and you determine user patterns. We, we predict that based on what the current numbers are now and what we forecast for the future to be. But yeah, it, I don't mean that like I didn't mean that like blindly. You have no idea. I'm just saying that you have no idea the ultimately what that curve looks like. Your operational yeah, cost, I get what you mean, right? Yeah. Versus like a freemium model, right? You can make that determination down the road. Now, the thing going back again, we did this episode. It's been a few months. I don't know if it's behind the members paywall. It might be, but the counterfeit episode. One of the interesting things that came out of that was we, there was a specific paper written by the FBI about where a number of stolen luxury goods and counterfeit luxury goods would end up in this particular intersection oh, of street wow. borders in Latin America, right? And uh, I think it was John D. had mentioned, and we touched on this briefly in the show, uh, uh, we already know that there are a lot of large law enforcement agencies that can't really use this service. They can't even get approval. Now, individual detectives or investigators can, just like you can go to Google, but it's not the same thing as actually bringing something to the evidence to your chain. Yeah. The flip side is, again, when it's systemic, right, they can start using it. But forget law enforcement for a moment. If you are the Anthony Fair example, if you're dealing in the gray market and deal reputations and you can reduce your exposure to stolen goods, that reduces your cost model as well. So, and that the, the reason I brought up that, that counterfeit paper is that those watches down there would then be franken watch they would take a case back and put it on top of another watch and as i think you know paul you know very well that rolex movements have a different serial number than the case backs do but they would mix and match they were still they weren't franken watches in the sense of you know replacement parts but they would do that just to make the tracking of the more difficult to re-import into certain countries right this is this is a type of use case that starts helping protect dealers and tracking these trends right again adoption pending yeah. So I don't think it's, I don't think it's all, all that unlikely that there's a possibility that there are enough adoption cases here that law enforcement becomes interested. Oh, because... look, Ali, law enforcement have been, they've been wonderful to us so far. I mean, everyone that we spot, I mean, we, we have some very good people, not only in the UK, in the US, but around the world, but particularly the UK and the US. And we are making some wonderful inroads with, with law enforcement and insurance companies as well. Um, they are, their reaction and, and, and the answers to our questions have been very, very positive. What about US law enforcement? I'm not familiar with, you know, UK it, law Okay, so we have... Uh, Interpol I am, but not... Brad, Brad, explain a little bit about Peter's role in this for me, can you please? You're probably better versed than me. Yeah, we have um, a uh, one of the members of our company uh, works uh, very closely with the Department of Justice um, and also the the Federal Department of Justice and the California Department of Justice. Uh, was he was just recently with President Biden um, having some discussions about you know security related crime issues and um, we are uh, I mean we can only say just what Paula said is that we're having just a phenomenal um, acceptance by the law enforcement basically saying, hey, how do we get set up? Uh, how do we do this? You know, they get a stolen watch. For the most part, there's nothing they can really do with it. They don't have a place to go put it where it's going to create any good that they've done in action, but now they do. Uh, I mean, there's complete uh, acceptance by every law enforcement we've met with. Well, well, and well sorry, sorry, Steve. I was just going to say before Steve comes in, I mean, the one thing that Again, I, I talk a lot in layman's terms because as Steve said from behind his his hands, I'm not, I'm not, go on, go on, Steve, do it again. He's not that smart. Actually, he's a very smart guy. Like, like before, you, please don't forget what you're about to say. Let me just say something about Paul Thorpe. So I've known the man for three years, and we have had daily conversations for three years, and it's beyond just putting this thing together. It's become personal relationship. I get to see somebody that you guys don't get to see in the background. And um, he's a very genuine man who truly cares about people. 
and he takes his shots and he still comes back heartbroken like what do i need to do to help them understand who i am he's a genuine guy and i you know so i, I make fun we, we joke around but he's a solid solid man Thank you, but Steve. say what you were going to say. I didn't want to interrupt you that way. You've kind of thrown me now. You've made me feel a bit emotional. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, what was I going to say? No, it's gone. Gone. Carry All on. right. I'll do the super chat then. Then you think about it, Paul, for a second. I'll give you a few few seconds leeway here. <laughs> we got Patel Philippe with $5 super chat. He says, not sure if you guys covered this, uh, any of this before, but a live demo or a basic demo would be interesting. Would so that... love to do that. Yeah. That is a great idea, Patel. Yeah, we could definitely get that going. I think Ali had mentioned that at some point. Uh, did you say that? Or am I, yeah, I, uh, I intend to. I'm actually going to enroll um, my watches uh, more or less live and you know just protect a little bit of PII and go through it as a separate episode. Um, I honestly, and I think I said this on, I think it was watching. And you guys would show. be welcome. I wasn't to come planning then. to actually, yeah. I wasn't planning to enroll until I had this conversation um, at a minimum because Paul and I on air, Paul's invited me kind of behind the kimono. So I want to have this conversation and maybe follow up conversation because as I've said on air, like for me, my day to day life, the risk model doesn't apply, but I acknowledge what Paul said is that if you look at the people who are suffering, like um, arms and extreme violent crime in certain larger cities or areas of the world, like if we actually believe what we say on the channel, like this is a watch community, we're all getting together, you know, at watch time New York for dinner and we're all friends and stuff like that. Like we're all, you know, we're all kind of touched by this and we're all mm -hmm. frankly privileged, right? We're talking a lot of five and six figure watches. So it behooves us to at least consider it. I want to have the conversation and, um, you know, and then and that's well said because if we, we don't go. at least consider it, then how do we truly build a watch community? We see there's a problem out there. And, and, and I still go back to the, the free model. So why would we want to charge on something that we see as a potentially good solution to solve a problem that's out there if we truly believe it's a problem? Why don't we just try to give it a chance and adopt? Are we saying it's perfect? We've never said that. And in fact, we, we welcome feedback, ideas, thoughts, and we always bring it to the team because we want to make it better. So I, I think that was well said by Ali. And, I, and I'm excited that you're going to add a watch to the blockchain and, and or to the vault and show how the soap process works. I think that would be very beneficial for, for, you know, all the watch guys out there. And I do agree. Like if everyone did their part and got involved in trying to push something ahead, as long as there are no serious negatives or any type of negatives, why not? Right. Why not? Well, we're talking, we're talking uh, a lot about the stolen watch issue, uh, but the digital watch vault really has two sides of the coin. The other side is the problems you know, the pride of ownership of a person's watch and documenting everything, you know, maybe I'm going to uh, leave the watch uh, to my daughter and now there's a story or, you know, more relevant will be, uh, let's say I have a watch and I want to sell you the watch. Well, how do you know that I'm saying I've had the watch for the last several years and I've had it serviced? How, how do you know? Well, I have this time stamped on my blockchain record and I can share that certificate with you through the vault. Fair enough. With images, timestamps all along the way, it's it's more of a complete story. Yeah, and I think that the the the, the if you get really dark and you think about the long con, I don't think that's going to work out. You know, in most cases. So there's a lot of there's a, because again, the the if you expand this, it's on the blockchain, so you can stamp, you can attach metadata to a transaction through Matic, right? Any which way you want. So the servicing place can log in and stamp that we did the service. Alex over at Perpetual Time can stamp it on blockchain, right? The, the history and the repudiation can work in multiple directions if there's adoption. Yeah. There's adoption. And imagine as a dealer, imagine if I'm a dealer and I sell the watch or a manufacturer and it goes through a distributor and a dealer, I no longer have any access to that watch. But now if they register their serial number at the watch, let's say the manufacturer, well, now later down the chain of ownership of that watch, well, that manufacturer, that dealer, they're time stamped on the blockchain. So it's a little bit of extra advertising. It's a connection of, of that watch's history back to the dealer. So now if I'm a new customer, I can call that dealer. Hey, I got a watch uh, that, that you'd sold a while back. I'd love to bring it in and have you uh, service it up. I think another component that could be interesting. I think another component that could be interesting is getting some watch collecting celebrities on board, right? 
because if they unload any of their watches now, maybe, I mean, I don't know if that really creates any value, but it certainly creates some interesting story, right? Like I got a great uh, story on, the, you know, on Marky the, Mar- Mark Wahlberg's uh, Daytona, you know, it, it, it's kind of cool. We've got a lot happening. We got, as I said, I can only reiterate that what we've done so far has been a soft launch deliberately has been a mm-hmm. soft launch. We've got a lot to be rolled out over the next few weeks. I'd like to finish in saying, first of all, a couple of things. I don't know. I remember what I was going to say. First of all, guys, thanks for, for having us on tonight. It's been an absolute pleasure. The second thing is, as I always say on my channel when I'm talking about watch dealers and what they say to their customers, etc., and I always say that talk's cheap. We, we are trying our utmost for everyone in this community. We're doing our best. We can't do any more than do that and deliver it for free. All we ask is that everyone adopts, if they've got a criticism, let us know. If they've got an idea, let us know. If they think they could help us improve it, let us know. This belongs to all of us. Yep. And can I jump? I know you have a few things to say. What other, there are others that are doing this, or a, a few, some are doing blockchain, some are doing lost stolen registry. But do you have them, their founders coming on and say, guys, tell us what you like, what you don't like, give us feedback, and let us bring it to the team and try to make this better. We did not build this for a watch manufacturer. We did not build this for the watch dealers. We didn't build it. We built it for the individual watch owner. We want the we want the feedback, good or bad, and we want to figure out how to make this the way we all can use this to better ourselves. Yeah, well, and that know. actually, I I utterly respect that. And I have said one of the things, and Paul's heard me say this. One of the things I disagree with Paul with is some of the people he's willing to uh, give the benefit of the doubt, or some of the people he's willing to talk to. But he's never shied away from saying, give me the criticism, give me the input, tell us what you want. Um, I will say like Bufaris and a couple other people, you know, some channel members, some some people we've known for a long time, uh, things like the FAQ privacy policies we went over earlier in the show. I don't want to kind of rehash all those. Uh, if you get a chance, look at the replay. If you don't get a chance, I'm just going to pull it up again. Um, take a look there. You know, you can register and see what you get, including heat map. They had a 27 page privacy policy. They had a extensive faq like really extensive faq and i'm sure they're going to be expanding based on something we want to expand that we want we want to know what you guys want answered and then the people asking about the dealers you know the trusted dealers they have testimonials that include a number of dealers as well um and you know some of these people like i've been a publicly not a huge fan of mondani but mondani's on board which is a valuable person happened on board big fan of spencer spencer's on board Right. So, can I, Ali, can I just say something there? When you when you said trusted dealers, I, I want to be careful with that one because we we are trying to encourage all dealers to sign up to the vault so they become more accountable. Just because someone, just because we allow a dealer to sign up to the vault, that doesn't mean to say that we approve of him. What it does yeah, mean to say, what it does mean to say, is that thank you for signing up. You do realize that you are now accountable for everything you sell to your customers. Which I think is more important, Paul, than someone who pays somebody to be a approved dealer, exactly. right? Like, Come on, Donnie. Exactly. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I'm not skirting around it. Like, you could be a trusted dealer just because yeah. you pay someone. I think it's much more important. You can't police everyone, right? You don't know what anyone's going to exactly. do from the day to day. But if you know you're implement- implementing a system that's going to make them more accountable, that is more important criteria in my eyes of being trusted exactly. dealer than because they paid you five bucks a month or 50 exactly. bucks a month or and, 500 and, bucks a month. And here's the proof of the pudding. Would we have allowed Anthony Farrer to join the vault? Yes. Mm. And i tell you why, because it would have made him more accountable. It could have helped. Actually. It could have helped. Know, you know, it really could have helped. For sure, but it could have. You know. It's trying to turn exactly. the lights on in your hurt. business a little bit. Doing business in the light, a little more open in the light, but yet still yeah. able to maintain uh, anonymity and privacy. Yeah. I just want to grab a few of these super chats here. Um, we got Neo says, "Can you get Archie his watches back?" We can uh, try. We can help. I mean, if, if they're in the system, in the vault, sure it would yeah. help, right? Jiggity with the five dollars super chat. Thank you, Jiggity. He says a lot of info to absorb. Thank you. It is yeah, a lot I think of info. A lot to digest here for mm-hmm. sure. And then we got Thomas Burnett with five pounds. He says, "Is Polygonmatic the blockchain that you are using to store information on?" Yep, Polygonmatic. That's correct. There you go. All right. I think we are caught up. All right, so I don't want to murder 
Uh, okay, last one, question. One, one more for them from Neo. Ten dollars. Thank you, Neo. Appreciate the support. He says, "Can I search the blockchain to see who owns a particular model and reach out to them to buy it? Can I look for JJ's piece unique and then deduce the rest of his collection?" We're not a sales platform. We're not. What? Yeah, so Neo, actually, I, I don't know. Is that a, is that a, is that a serious question? Because uh, semi-serious. I think. Okay. Oh, no. it it's, it's actually. Fun, it's actually. It it's a good question. My, it's one of the things. This is what a side channel attack. This is what I would look at because interacting through app and interacting with blockchain are two different things. So I have no idea if you're storing, say, the PII on the blockchain, or if you're storing hash mm -hmm. keys on the blockchain. Which is I'm more so like, glad right? you brought that up. Yeah, we're comfortable. Right? So all of those questions are things Neo that. You know, when Paul said he's going to open up the kimono, I'm going to come on here and I'm going to say, how much did they open up the kimono? Did they, and I'm not very, necessarily going to disclose funny. proprietary IP, but I'm going to, it's the idea of the attestation that I said earlier in the show. Yeah. I, I want to feel comfortable to say that not being for paid engagement, I can attest to that they've thought of the type of problems, which a professional bad guy, which I literally was, right, um, would think of. And one of the questions is, I interact with blockchains all the time, like Odyssey. Uh, which is a video platform you can interact directly with the blockchain and get all the videos that have been taken down because that's what a blockchain is so right. just for the record can we get an answer from uh, i guess you know this is yeah. this will directed at steve uh can he search the blockchain to see if he could get my piece uniques i can send you if i sent you the hashtag used to add that data to the blockchain then you'd be able to see the data on the blockchain but which which data he would not be able Whatever. to uh, reach out to uh, Jake. Well, he wants to know a particular model and, and if he'd be able to reach out to who has that particular model. So, uh, no, this, I mean, they would have to share the blockchain no. certificate from his vault directly to that person. So, you, can, you cannot search for someone else's what is no. Wait, 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 wait. Well, he's um, saying search, not if I share it. So, he wants yeah. to know can he go on this blockchain I, and search to see who owns a particular model that's listed on you? No, 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 no. Mm -mm. So think about this. ultimately, if you think about this, a cryptocurrency for the people who have crypto wallets, you have your private keys and you have your bit, you know, code for recovery and stuff like that. There's still a whole transactional, right, um, aspects to it that, uh, uh, you know, that, that comes into play that they're not handling. They've made it clear on the website that that's still part of the interaction. So you still, I'm, for the lack of a better term, it's not exactly this. You still maintain private keys for a lot of you. Oh, of course you do. Blockchain. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and we don't tie your private information onto the blockchain. It's the data. It's the provenance of the watch. Because, Ali, say that you have a watch on the on, in the vault on the blockchain. You sold me the watch. And you transferred me that blockchain data. Now I'm in its provenance, right? But it doesn't say anything about Ali. It doesn't say anything about Steve Allen. It's the data of the watch. So it's just the data of the watch that's on the blockchain and it's select data as well. We're not about NFTs. You hear a lot about make a digital, um, a digital replica of a physical asset or anything like that. It is purely a way to document the history of your watch and safeguard it so it can't be tampered with, yet provide accountability because of timestamps and encryption and things like that. Two separate data, like a bank, two separate data. But I think it's a great question because I think that was something that anybody might be concerned about. Like, well, oh my goodness, well, sure. what's my? It goes. We, we don't want the to, analogy you know, to this. The simplest way to think about this is: Do you need our address? Because people are like, well, now oh. I'm going to give a company the address of where I have all my value watches, right? It's like craziness. in the simplest terms, that's yeah. the way they're, you know. But but in all fairness, we, we haven't so. done as good a job to explain what it does and what it doesn't do, what it can and what it can't do. And we just need to be better at explaining that. Well, the audience, right, you know, the the, the the problem here is that you have an adoption audience and then you have the neckbeard audience and the crypto bros audience, and then you have the security audience. You're not gonna be able to make satisfy all the audiences, right? So mm -hmm. this goes back to my point of when I dealt with my clients before, I, you know, security professional, but you're not a security company. You have to have reasonable expectations. Um, again, you guys have been here for an hour and a half. I oh my gosh, and I could be here another hour and a half. I love this. <laughs> I love it. Right. I might, I might so, hang out and JJ's hang out. Okay, you're welcome, man. You're, you're, you're welcome, welcome to stay as long as you We like. do not, as as some of the people in the audience have come over from the uh, some of the competing channels, uh, less friendly channels, we do not censor. They're welcome here. They're welcome to ask their questions and, and stick around. Everybody's welcome here, as long as you're not a complete douchebag. Um, so, 
I don't want to keep going down Digital Watch Vault at the moment unless you guys want to make closing statements. Because no, I'm good. I'm good. I think I think I've said everything I want to say. I don't know if Steve or Brad wants to you know wants to add anything. Um, I'm I'm good. All right, I'm gonna roll through these super chats real quick. Oh, unless you guys want, oh, I'm sorry. Did you guys want to add? Good, if you want. I think Brad needs to pick his daughter up anyway. Brad, oh, you know, she's she's here. She's uh, you know. Oh, you got it now. Okay, today. it's all good. But uh, you know, we 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 are anticipating in our phase two adoption by you know plat sales platforms, you know the and and uh, other established uh, companies in the watch industry. You know, there's uh, some great companies like you know Hodinkee is out there, and you know we can integrate the vault through their systems. You know, so we. We see our right now. Yes, we're in the <clears throat> innovator phase, and then we're going to have our early adopters before we do break through more into the mass market. Um, but our trajectory is looking great. Nice, very good. I'm going to grab a couple of these super chats, and Steve, if you want to jump in after that, uh, let me just catch up here. We got Ryan Joffrey with two dollars super chat. He says, "Love from Albuquerque." Bless you, JJ. Thank you, Ryan. Appreciate the support. And then we got a super sticker from our man, the medium legend Toyota Mo. Ten dollars. Thank you, Mo. Appreciate that. And we got a member chat from the Whiskey Reaper. I see you, Reaper. He says, shout out to Bitcoin, XRP, but not Sam Bankman, Freed from FTX. I see you, JJ, Ali, and Paul. Don't forget everybody else on the panel, man. Come on. Be kind. Get everybody in there. Thank you, Whiskey Reaper. Just, just teasing you a little bit. Uh, Steve, did you want to give any closing statements on uh, I, Digital Watch? Paul, I appreciate we, uh... that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I um, I hope this is a, a constant conversation with you guys on your channel. I mentioned before I'm a big fan, but I think the whole thing is just thank you. Thank you for allowing us to come on and begin to talk about what it is, what it does, answer questions from your um, from the community, and and try to figure out how do we do this better, how do we make it better, how do we move to the next steps, and I don't know. I just I'm a, I am appreciative of the opportunity to be here. You're, you're the first. You're the first live that you brought us all together to talk about this. It's our pleasure. You know, a lot of people like to throw mud and, and make things personal. I want to get answers to questions and decide what's good for me, what's not good for me. And you know what? What may be good for 50% of the chat may not be good for the other 50. You know, that's a personal decision. I don't try to sway anyone. We try to get to the bottom of things, you know, like adults, factually, talk it out see what's what and go from there. But we appreciate you guys time. And uh, it's, um, you know, it was a pleasure having you and you guys are always welcome back. We could do a dry run, uh, a demo for everybody, all that stuff. And we got uh, Bufaris with a hundred Durham's. He says, I understand the block that is AI key holder. Is it AI key? Am I reading this right? Ali, help me out here. That's a key that holder, right? Oh, a key holder so. to agree yeah. on such to unblock information, just can't see how it works. I'm not so, sure. So, so go first. We can actually, I think, uh, uh, we can actually do like a thumbnail sketch, literally of like what the application architecture looks like after we, for the audience, if if we think that's something the audience wants. A couple other people have picked on like certain, you know, technically, um, uh, you know, tokenized first NFTs, the colloquial use of the term NFTs first, you know, actual NFTs. There are a couple of people picking on those type of things as well. So first, I think probably a follow-up based on when they, I'm going to put it this way, when they launch their apps and we can look at the whole architectural ecosystem um, and pending what Steve wants to do and Paul and, and probably want to do, we can talk, we can talk about like an architectural thumbnail sketch of how this all works and how it intergra interacts with the Polygon blockchain and the Matic and the equivalents, the gas fees and things like that, which they're not the same. I'm just using it as colloquial terms. I'll leave I'm that sure to you can, and Steve. We can talk about that. You can count me out of that uh, one. That's, I, that's a technical. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I mean, obviously, I want to be careful in some of those conversations because we do have some patent pending technologies to help. Yeah. Reduce our no, I think that's a re I think that's a recording we do and not a live. I think that's okay. what it comes down to is that we do a recording so we can agree on because intellectual property is intellectual property. Yeah, but yeah. we do have you would be shocked at how many people in our audience are not only IT people, but they're, you know, crypto pros or they're yeah, a lot of we have people who are like, I know we have some of the audience who's a Kubernetes expert. We've got somebody who does, uh, you know, AI language models. I love you know, it. We have a lot That's of amazing. we have a lot of really bright people who watch the show who would be interested. Yeah. Yeah, and the, and just I mean it can go on and on and on, right? But we never we're not NFTs, we're not tokenization. I mentioned about tokens, similar to how a bank will pull your bank details to your personal details. 
but I didn't mention tokenization nor NFTs. We purposely don't want to do go down that road of the traditional what people think of blockchain. It's yeah, another great conversation. Yeah, there, there's a there's an aspect of trying to have a conversation at a colloquial level and versus a technical level, and we're trying to like on the fly trying to merge into conversations and a lot of never going to work. No, right? we're going to lose half the audience one way or another. So, yeah. all right, let me pull up the, we have, I want to make sure we get the super chats. Um, Bufferus, we covered that one. Thank you very much for your super chat, Bufferus. We have Golden Baba, $1.99, your, your phones, your watch, come on, man. Um, you know what? <laughs> hey, I'm You're sorry not... about that. Let me, let me get this one for Golden Baba. Go back, because this is, um, I don't know if you know this one. It's, I don't know this one. Your phones, your watch, come on, man. That's a Jimmy C. It's Jimmy C. Uh, shout out to our friend. Oh, Jimmy, Jimmy C. C. Okay. It's a little no, Jimmy C. Uh, reference. Excuse me, that I, I stepped away a couple times. I'm, I'm dealing with a chest cold, so I've been coughing up a couple. Times. <laughs> uh, so, so fair enough. Um, so so I don't know if we want let's, to. Let's leave these gentlemen to the rest of their show. Thank you so much for having us on. Really appreciate it. Anytime, anytime. It's been yeah, our anytime. pleasure. Thank you. It's been great. So I'm sure Steve, you and I, uh, Paul, you can share my contact information um, and we can connect on the follow-up, Steve and Bradley. Thank you for uh, letting us take you away from your daughter. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you guys. You're welcome back anytime. We could set up another uh, you know, demo whenever you guys want. And uh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for coming on. I think guys. more than I anything, I want Paul to teach me how to dress. I can barely dress myself. <laughs> right? Always. Right? Always. Right. Uh, always. I mean, you, let me tell you something. You wouldn't want me to stand up because I've got me shorts on. My... <laughs> <laughs> like a news anchor, right? <laughs> Uh, that's yeah. funny. Uh, Watch it. Watches so, in style with Paul Thorpe coming. Yeah. The, the link is pinned for Digital Watch Ball people. If you feel, um, again, I'm going to enroll live in one of these upcoming episodes. Uh, if you feel so inclined, they have a great FAQ. Go learn some more. They got quite a few videos as well. So, thank you guys. Yeah. Have any questions? Send it to hello at digitalwatchvault.com. Right, Brad? Yes. Yeah. Hello or support on the website. Or support. Yep. We'll see Cheers. you soon. Thank bye you bye. Guys. Appreciate thank it. You. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. There they are, ladies and gentlemen, the Digital Watch Vault team, accompanied by Paul Thorpe. We're going to open up this panel. It's party time. We've given, we got about another 20 or so minutes. Just so you guys know, we're going to run the banner now. It is a good time to let you people know that it is still, oh, <laughs> we both did it, still super chat of the daytime. And uh, you guys got a good chance, some good odds today because you don't have as much competition as normal. So if you guys want to hop on the panel, the door is open. Um, we are going to drop the link. Everybody is welcome to come hang out and chat with us if you want. We're going to be linking to Archie in about, I don't know, 20 minutes or so, whenever a uh, big boy decides to run the show. Until then, a big boy. We'll, yeah, we'll be hanging with us. I don't even know if there's watch news because I was too busy, uh, too busy with the, uh, what you might call it, we got Patel Philippe, two dollars Canadian. He says one horse for Blondie. All right, we'll throw a horse for Blondie. Thank All right, so just, I'm gonna say this for the record, and this is my call. This is the JJ's call, Tan. We're gonna <laughs> after this, we're gonna stop doing the entries for other people because it adds a logistical problem. If the people also end up being the winner at the end of the month, it adds a whole other set of problems. So right. um, after after Tan's today, because Tan is. The man, yeah. right? Tan's been not, very generous today, so we're not going to hold him accountable. But you know what it is, because we usually what we do is, um, we do like no matter what you, how much you, you know you put in, it's just one entry, so it's not about like buying away how in, much just yeah, for fun, exactly. right? So logistically, it just it, it's a problem to like get other people in, you know what I mean? But we got you for today, Tan. You know, just we were actually speaking about that last night, and then we got Brody with the three dollars super sticker. Thank you, Brody. Greatly appreciated. Uh, the, well, this is, you know why he's doing We should do a two-horse race. Let's just do this for fun. Can we do one for fun? We're just Blondie versus Reaper because they've been going at it like crazy. So maybe we can do one. Mo, what are you getting chased by the cops? What's going on there? It's city <laughs> life, man. It is city life. It's hard. Yeah. I go to my, my private dining area out here at work, and I'm getting distracted with But anyways. But, uh, yeah, what's up, boys? What's, what's going up, on? buddy? Mr. Z, hey. we're gonna put we're gonna put one entry in for you. Uh, if you want to send it to Narc, that's quite up to you. I mean, I'm not, I don't think he's gonna give us his info anyway. <laughs> Pretty sure he's just messing Jay, with Jay, us. Have you seen the comments from the last video? No. Yeah, from last know. night's show. No, is it good? Hallway confirmed that he is going to do a yep. race announcement for us. He did confirm. 
Well, this would be the time. Let him do Blondie versus Reaper race, just like as a practice run. Poway, if you're listening, oh, oh, those guys hop are on. This is an easy practice going one. At it. Two... Yeah, yeah. Whoever wins, uh, I don't know. I should mail them something funny if they want it, just for, just for fun. Uh, all right, Mr. Z, thank you. And then we got Joe with the $10 super chat. Thank you, Joe. He says, heavyweight contender. That should be a heavyweight champ after those three KOs. I like those guys, but sheesh. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate the support. And let's see what else we got. Bob NYC, $10. Thank you, Bob. He says you guys are the best. Thank you. Greatly appreciate the support. We got our man Show Enough in the house with the $5 super chat. He says, come on, Krypton. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> uh, funny stuff. Poway, are you in the chat? Do you want to do the two horse race? This is the battle. Battle between Reaper and Blondie. Who will win? All right, let's do this one for fun. Let's see what happens. Maybe I'll send one you a prize. Maybe not. I don't know yet. We'll see. Should I send you a prize? You ready? All right. I, we don't have to shuffle on with the two horse race. <laughs> right, now, right, this right. is hilarious because Blondie, it, I think they're both women, but Blondie's actually on like a pink. <laughs> <laughs> what? So, all, all right. right, here we go. All right, we got Whiskey Reaper and Blondie running neck and neck. The battle is strong between these two. The battle of the bad blood. Here they go, coming down the stretch. Both of them kind of a bit slow, but they are neck and neck, going blow for blow. Who will win? It looks like Blondie's starting to take a lead. But you know Reaper doesn't give up that easy. He's whipping that horse into shape. But Blondie is holding by, a, by about a neck. We're going to say they're neck and neck. She's got about a nose on him. Who will win? Mm. We'll find out in about 10 seconds. Looks like the Reaper is coming on strong. He looks like he's about to take it with seven minutes down the stretch. Blondie's starting to fade. She's getting a little tired. Oh, Reaper he puts hit the a little boost. pep in his step. Look at that nitro. All right. <laughs> that was pretty funny. I see you, Reaper. Reaper and Mutter. Yeah, Reaper's and the Mutter horse. They, they won. Uh, good stuff. All right, that was funny. I just wanted to do them too because they've been battling so hard. By the way, I don't know if you spoke to Duco uh, or not, but we got Duco in the house. Duco, you won last night. Um, yeah, I did. I told them. All right, cool. So you yeah, have cool stuff. That was a really close race last night. Yeah, that yeah was I, really I, I watched it. I had to watch it like two more times to make sure like there was no confusion. Right. No, it, it was legit. Duco won. It was legit. Yeah, was yeah. Legit. yeah. It, was it was like a, a lot of uh, pausing and checking just to. To verify, but it was confirmed. The high horse always. <laughs> yeah, Duco, I'm jealous. You got a little bit of wick. You got the John Wick. Did they make like the actual coin anywhere? You know, like I, have, the... I will. I will bring you. I will bring you some in New York. I have them in silver, gold, platinum. I have all the all of them. Oh, just give me the gold ones. Don't worry about the rest. No, <laughs> totally, I'm totally kidding. No, but I mean, do they have like the actual coin from the movie mm -hmm. that you get? Oh, that's cool. Mm -hmm. That's when you know. Like my yeah, they have they have out. they have six different types of coins in different sizes, and then they have two different types of plates. Um, oh man, I didn't know that. I have That's sets awesome. of all of them. Yeah. We got our friend Bahrain watch collector in the in the house. <laughs> Sorry, I was choking a little bit. Fifty dollars super chat. Thank you very much. Super sticker. It's a, a, a oh, what do you got a a hippo on a chair turning into Voltron. Very cool. I like that one. one <laughs> Long time no see, Bahrain. Yeah, good to see you, my man. Good seeing you, uh, man. Greatly appreciated. All right. We're going to, um, let's see here. So what's going on, Mo? What are you doing? You're at work? What's the deal? Yeah, I'm about to leave. It's fucking slow. I'm literally going to take off. Um, I will uh, catch up with you guys later because I'm going to pack my shit up and go. See you guys. Take care, buddy. All right. Later, Mo. Yeah. And we got a $5 super sticker from Brent. Thank you very much, Brent. Appreciate the support. Thank you. Thank you. I did drop the link if anyone else wants to come on and chat. Um, so I'm curious your opinion. How did you think that went? There's a lot of technical. Oh, do you care to comment today or you want no, to I mean, digest think, it a bit? No, no, I don't mind. I don't mind. Like, I, I don't know. You know, again, I stated why I didn't adopt until I was having the conversation. I think that it was very reassuring to hear some of the answers um, showed a level of awareness uh, that I appreciated. I also, it was very reassuring. I spent hours. I read the FAQ and stuff. They did put together a nice launch site. I'm sorry. Like anybody mm -hmm. can shit on them for whatever they want. They put together a nice launch site and they tried to cover a lot of ground. At the same time, the privacy policy 27 pages, there's all sorts of stuff that's boilerplate in there that needs work. 
Um, I think you saw, I mentioned things like various countries have different laws that, that supersede the GDPR in, in the European domain, like the Turkish data protection law is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So there's things they got to work on. Um, but there, there are a lot of things they've thought about and adoption, as they said over and over again, is key. So I will be adopting the platform uh, in terms of I, they really should be enough to to register my watches, and I will do so either recording or live on it or something like that. Uh, I'm probably going to wait till the first app, the Android app, comes out, um, mm -hmm. just to have that full experience end to end. Uh, uh, but I also have, you know, I, there there are large law enforcement agencies that will have a very difficult time adopting something like this or using it. But I have my own law enforcement, state and federal, uh, you know. Uh, experiences that there will be places that do use it for systemic type crime issues. I think that's important. And we did that counterfeit, man. We did that episode and I can't shake that episode. Mm -hmm. How much of the luxury watch market has made for like really bad actors. Yeah. I, I think, you know, as long as there's no downside, which I, I don't want to recommend. I mean, obviously there could be a downside to anything, right? Anything's possible, yeah. but a significant that would affect you in, in, a, in a really negative way type of downside. I think it it makes sense for us to um, all kind of do our part in what, and I'm not even saying with this specific, you know, product, but in any ways that would help, you know, even curb the crime, right? Curb the crime. Like if it does, you know, if it does wind up working out with, there's enough people doing it that it makes it very difficult for these thieves to move watches in one way or another. I don't think it'll ever stop it completely, but it'll definitely hinder it. Um, then I think it's worth it for us to, uh, you know, do our part. And I think it starts, you know, from the top down, from manufacturer to dealer to the actual end user, you know. Yeah. But, I mean, multiple things can be true at once. You don't, you know, that might be the most important, but everyone can start somewhere, you know, so. Yeah, and, you know, the, thank you, Duco. Uh, I, I, I don't take tips. I, I believe the tip culture is, <laughs> the tip culture is oversaturated us. <laughs> Um, Duco with ten dollars super chat says, "Is there a tip job for all the unpaid interns? Only when they're working the polls, Duco. Only when they're working the polls. We don't <laughs> want to be on the polls, Duco. I, 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 I also appreciate that Paul. You know, they heard me say things. You know, that that may not be a lot of fun to say, and threat models and the way I look at things. I really do think that the you know, there are threat model considerations that a service like that needs to can take, and and they've offered again to to talk to me behind the scenes. So I will." Um, because it is important to me, right? It just is. That's fair. Very fair. Now we got Patel Philippe with the $5 super chat. He says, all this episode has given, this has given me a strange craving for, I don't know. Horma Sabzi. What's that? Can you think? Uh, it directly, it directly translates to gourmet greens. It's a stew on rice that is herbs, usually beef or, or lamb on top of a bed of white rice. Mm. Oh, I like the got, beef and white rice part. I like how he, he you know, he goes, he works, he works out, he gets a nice pump going, then he gets a camera angle going, he, pop, right. he pops a little additional creatine. Gets then he on comes that. on, he's just like, yeah, come here. Exactly. Let me, let me show you guys something. I'll show you what I'm doing. <laughs> I'll show you what I'm doing. Uh -oh, let's get him in position here. Hold on, Duco. One second, please. Let me put you where you need to be. All right, give it to us. What do we got here? What are we doing? He's clearing land. Now, can you see my daughter? Oh, I got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't see her. Yeah, right. She's on the. She's sitting on the ground. With this oh, thing. yeah. She's target practicing. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah. You got it. So this is great. Duco's on air. I've actually got to tell this story on it. So Duco and I, we met up in Orlando, and we went to a uh, luxury timepiece, diamond timepiece, whatever in Disney Springs, Orlando. Right? There are an AD that has Zenit, Elis Nardan, you know other things. Okay. We go in, uh, lady starts kind of helping me asking questions, and then another one comes up because Duco's there, and she's, like, Duco was the thirst trap. It was fantastic. She's starting to ask Duco if there's any watches he wants to see, and I'm like, I'm answering the questions, because I'm the one looking at the watches. She's totally ignoring me. Like, <laughs> like what does Duco want to see? It was uh, fantastic. You're so full of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what happened. It's exactly what happened. We have a no. conspiracy here. We have a conspiracy. We need to get to the bottom of this now. No, he pointed and said, he, he's he's the one you're going to talk to. Don't talk to me. I'm I'm the man with the briefcase. <laughs> I'm carrying his briefcase for him. That's funny. Stuff. That's right. That's right. 
So how'd the show go? Oh, well, it was a, quite a bit out of my depth, but I was trying to hang out, hang on for dear life and figure out what was going on. But uh, Ali did a commendable job, as always. It was interesting to uh, watch. And Duco, you know this is impossible, right? Because you have, again, our audience is this massive mix. So there's some people who like were just shitting all over me for even wanting to talk to Paul because they're like something else. Other people are like blocking me, like is meaningless. And it, like everything, everybody can have something they pick on. That's either very technical, very non-technical, or they can pick on Paul because they don't like Paul. Right? Yeah. It's an impossible thing to do. And all I want to do is have the conversation. Me personally, the fact that they were willing to bring three people on and have the conversation live, I, I'm that's a fantastic, that's a fantastic start. And Jacob Bucco, it's another manufacturer. Jacob Bucco, you know, that's that's non-trivial. That's a yeah. high-end manufacturer that's... to get involved in the mix, right? And then yeah. He says that there are the law enforcement agencies. They're based out of LA. They're talking to in California. That's non-trivial. So let's see where this goes, man. And I wish him the best of luck because, like, you can say whatever you want about Paul, but nobody has covered watch theft and the resulting catastrophes nearly as much as Paul Ford has. You know, but if you so my my only question is is if I'm a watch thief and I steal, let's say, a Rolex Submariner. I don't care if I sell it for $10,000 or $1,000. So what does the digital watch vault no, do for me? You are, no, no. See, in that case, you're a thief, not a watch thief. And there's a difference. When watch, like the network they were talking about that's been going through Miami from Chile, right? And I'm not familiar with that network, but I am familiar with another network that operates out of Southern California. Um, because one of our viewers actually reached out to us after the counterfeit episode, right? So if you are an actual watch thief, then the return on investment to the risk, you know what you should be getting and you know what markets to sell to, which is why, again, in that counterfeit episode, certain people end up selling in Latin America at the three regions merging versus other people sell upon storms in the United States just diagonal across the country. Like, so you, a, a, a watch thief has a systemic risk model, just like the ones Paul Thorpe covers, right? The ones that are on bicycles and stuff. A thief may not. So a thief will take what they can get for a watch. And if, and if they go take it to, to, to sell it and somebody says this is a fake and they're just a thief and it's real, well, they're still going to take $10 for the fake, even if it's genuine. And even the buyers of stolen goods know this. The buyers of stolen goods know if the people know what they're doing. Yeah. Right. So, but a thief could register. They could go to try to register the watch as their own and establish provenance. Right. But a watch thief that does it systemically it gets harder right they have to generate new identities to do so there's all sorts of good and bad use cases like nefarious use cases as well i refer to some of them on the air it's tough to it's tough to know um it's tough to know where this goes until i mean until we have a certain degree of adoption and Mm -hmm. golden bottle most watches are probably still like these not watching you're absolutely right uh uh, I don't think those are the ones that necessarily Paul Thorpe covers. But yeah, most watches are, are probably stolen by thieves and not watch thieves. But yeah. it, the Anthony Fair, I brought that question up for a reason, right? I think the Anthony Fair example and the, and the backpack dealer example is a good one. If you were a Vukum who was on air, right? John Buckley was on air. If you were dealing with a group with 2,000 people, one additional way to validate the people in your group, it's a paid membership dealer group, is you're going to put every damn watch you're about to sell on digital watch vault. Because now they're tying to the blockchain a certain degree of repudiation. They're distributing the risk of managing that group, the Vuka group, as an example. And if I was in that business, I think I would do that. Maybe not with Digital Watch Vault, maybe with Digital Watch Vault, but like yeah. I would want to distribute the risk and repudiation of it if I'm dealing with a ton of different dealers and backpack dealers. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. It gives people some confidence too that, you know, I mean, if you go to a great dealer, it's very possible they could be selling a watch. They have no idea it's stolen. And then the track you find out. And th- this definitely helps in that event. Yeah, um, and it leaves smaller areas for people like a goddamn Anthony Fair to hide. Mm-hmm. And we got the Reaper joining us. And then I want to get to these super chats. Welcome, Reaper. Hey, man. What's up? What are... What's going on? What are we doing? We're cooking. Hey, what's up, Ali? Who's, up, who's, uh, this is Duco, right? Yeah. What's up, man? man? Hey, man. What, what is up? What up? Uh, yeah, go through the go through the uh, super chats. Grab these super chats quick, and then we could uh, 
we're gonna uh, we're gonna actually run the race uh, in a little bit. We got Ryan Joffrey with uh, two dollars super chat. He says, "My best friend is from Long Island, the Hamptons, New York. Very cool. I used to party down in the Hamptons back in the day." Then we got two dollars super chat from Anthony P. He says, "Great early show, guys. Thank you, Anthony P. We appreciate the support. Make sure you go check out Anthony P.'s cigar channel, by the way. It's been a pretty cool cigar lounge. Uh, I try to get the one early show in uh, once you know once during the week. Um, and I appreciate, uh, of course, Ali." Uh, knocking it out of the park with some in-depth questions um i hope you guys enjoyed that today and then oops sorry uh um, bob nyc ten dollar super chat he says do you guys have any opinions on our of the h moser pioneer center seconds 43 mil i have lots of opinions i think that's an awesome watch and you have a giant sized wrist so i say uh 43 will fit you well um let me see if i can pull that up Real quick for you. Each. Hey, right. what, what were you guys uh, talking about before I got here? Because I I, uh, I had to put the I have the barbecue on right now. I usually barbecue around this time. What you guys talking about? What are you doing? Chilling and grilling? I actually yeah. I'm actually uh, <laughs> grilling. <laughs> Hell yeah. That's hey, you got to do it that way. I know you're into food, so I do know you recently told me that. I didn't know that. I didn't know of that. Oh yeah, yeah. Gotta yeah. eat, man. All right, you gotta eat. Up real quick for. Our man Bob NYC give him some value for money here. So this is the what the fuck? Here it is. This is the Pioneer Center Seconds from Moser. I think this is a gorgeous watch. Super fun. Um large size, good wrist presence. Awesome watch, Bob. Um I would say if you want to take it a step further, you could find these with a turb. Nice turbion at a killer value. I think that's where the sweet spot for a turb is. Obviously it's triple the price, but you know, if you're looking up to forty thousand dollar range, you could find these, and they're probably going to go down even more. But you know, if you want to spend between fifteen and twenty, this is not a bad way to do it either. Uh, super cool watch. I'm a fan of Moser. I really, I find them interesting, and they're definitely out of the norm. So I don't know if anyone else wants to add anything to that, but I, I, I really, really do like the watch. But uh, I want to different direction. And if I keep uh, looking at these watches, I'll end up with like 80 mm -hmm. watches again. I can't do it. I'll, I'll start crying. You could probably get these for like 15 and up, a little up. Um, I, I personally, if you, I mean, if you could do it, I would try to get the the Turbion version in the high 30s. Not Doesn't actually. Muhammad Ali, is this the watch he has, but the maroon? He has the red so dial. Very small um, watch in red. But he has the Endeavor, I think, right? I'm, yeah. I'm not sure. I remember. Yeah, it is the Endeavor, right? I don't know, so many watches, so little time. Hard to keep track of all of them. Is, is that your is that your nickname, Ali? Muhammad Ali? No, that's somebody else. Yeah. Oh, okay. Different, different fellow, different fellow. I actually, I need to bug out here in a minute, so we're gonna have to like last call on race entries. Yeah, we're gonna do that right now. This is the we're gonna we're gonna call it in nine seconds, guys, or whatever, roughly nine seconds. So, get them in now if you uh, want to get involved in the uh, in the race. We're gonna do that coming up right after this question. So we got Jeremy Butcher, our man, the Butcher, $2 Super Chat. He says, working for the man, lurking in the chats. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you for your support. Greatly appreciated. Good to see you in the chat. Um, we're going to uh, call it, if nothing comes up in the next few seconds, we're going to get ready to rock and roll. Obviously, I give you a little leeway if you're typing. but No, I got, I got everything loaded. And anybody? Last call, last call. Nobody? Last call for All alcohol. Right. All right, so we have 25 entries, starting with Watches 63. I did mm -hmm. put in the Reaper, the Blondie, and Mr. Soso. Asked, I put in the entry for him and Stalker Mark. This is okay. the last show we're doing. Yeah, yeah. After this, it's only one entry for you. So, oh, can we get my uh, your friend Mikey in that? I can get, I can get Michael. Michael. All right, that's it. That's it. Last one because right, so he was probably typing Michael, the whole time. Two dollars super chat from your friend Mikey says, "Can I race name Cole Trickle?" Sure. I should put Mike in parentheses so we know who it is in case he wins. Yeah, so we don't forget. Or Michael. <laughs> I'm looking at the chat room. I usually don't look at the chat room, but man, holy heavens. All right, and <laughs> we're going to do the zombies again since it's October. Sounds good. All right, let's get this race going. Let's get a shuffle going. And we're off. And they're off. Here comes two cars out of the stretch. He's going really fast, but really mean looks like he's about to be dead. Watch a 63 is also looking like he's dying out, but Joe is maintaining a very steady, steady speed. 
the zombies are out for the apocalypse who will win this race nobody knows we got the cap in the chat good to see him saying hello to everybody but joe is holding his lead here comes jb jb creeping from the backfield will he make it nobody knows but here comes thomas burnett zooming away it looks like he ran out of steam though not today uh let's see who else do we got coming up no oh, right uh thomas is holding that lead and there's a mystery man right beside him that we can't see here yeah. comes neo taking a run for it Thomas Burnett squeaked out i had toyota Mo. nice oh that was toyota Mo. i couldn't see who the other person was congrats thomas burnett you are today's winner and mr zozo i did put stalker we now the fun, yeah, zombies are slow as fuck. It doesn't. The penguins were also slow, but the race is still the same length, the same amount of time. Right. Yeah, it's it's forty something seconds either way. Whatever it is, yeah. slow or not slow. All right, I got that. Set All right, there. folks, I have to run. All right, we're gonna be wrapping in a minute, but uh, yeah, good to see you, out. Ali. Take care, Whiskey Reaper, Duco. See always ya. good to see you, sexy JJ. Thank see you, buddy. for letting me ruin your show. Oh, you did excellent. Without you, uh, <laughs> that interview would not have gone anywhere near as good. We appreciate it. Well, that was great. Horrible, <laughs> horrible bad joke. Love it. Take care, folks. <laughs> Congrats, Thomas. Good job. Uh, so what do we got on the table, Reaper? We got about two to three minutes before we're about to wrap. So let's give it a plug here. What are we doing today? Hey, what we're doing today is a chat room. I think we should give it to the chat room because they're lighting up everything. I see a lot of people asking questions about Blondie. Look, man, I can't say anything about Blondie. Let her do her thing. I don't know what the what what the people think, but uh, no, I haven't haven't been with her, and hopefully, I don't see her. That's the main goal. Uh, but I see the chat room. Uh, but anyways, these over here are what you're going to see in holiday season. If you don't know about these, it's a little bit cheaper whiskey that you can use for the holidays, especially uh, Thanksgiving, early times. You can get this very, very cheap. And then also, I think everybody knows about this other bottle over here. This is something you're going to see more in the holiday season. So if you're into a lot of whiskey, especially if you're an American, I think you're going to see a lot, a lot of whiskeys at your store. Every company is going to want to try to get you. So right now is the time. If you want to start shopping for stuff for Christmas, uh, for Thanksgiving, now would be the time to get something. Nice, nice. Now, Reaper, I hate to cut you short. You did an excellent spot there. But I got to send the link over to Arch. So I want to thank, of course, Ali for helping run the interview, kicking ass and taking names, Paul Thorpe and the crew for joining us. I'd like to thank Duco and Whiskey Reaper for coming on at the end and give us a little fun. And I want to most importantly thank you guys in the chat for hanging with us. We had 170 strong for most of that interview, and it does not go unnoticed. Uh, we will be back, what is today, Thursday day, maybe tomorrow night or Sunday night. Well, definitely Sunday night. I'm going to have a big guest on Sunday night unless he bails out, but as of right now, we are locked in. So make sure you uh, come join us. Friday night will just be a fun night, as usual. We'll be hanging if, if, if it happens. So we will see how it goes. But until then, we're going to send you guys over to Archie. So just hang right here. And thanks for hanging out with us, guys. Peace. See you. You won't be running in 2023 at Tip Top Snack Bar!